All right, good morning. Grab a seat, please. My name is Kyle. It's good to have you all here in all of our mostly bright Easter colors. Thank you, thank you. Jesus rose from the dead. We celebrate that, and we celebrate this truth that he brings new life. The scriptures are written, and we are gathered here and singing and living our lives to demonstrate that Jesus actually brings new life. And this is what humanity needs. This is what our society needs. Everybody knows our society is struggling. There's no uh, <clears throat> end to reasons as to why people think that we're struggling. But the bottom line is we need new life. We don't just need a little adjustment here, a little tweak there, or some sort of revitalization. We need actual new life. And that's our hope. <clears throat> and it comes, our hope for new life comes from the simple truth that Jesus rose from the dead. And that's what we celebrate today. And we've been... Um, really thinking about the glory of Christ and how, how all of these events that we celebrate during Holy Week declare Christ's glory, and we've been wanting to emphasize that, even uh, in the Stations of the Cross going through Mark. If you haven't had a chance to go through Stations of the Cross, it's open until 10 p.m. tonight. Uh, it's a little display, it's nine stations of displays to experience the Gospel of Mark uh, in a way that really uh, helps us understand what it is and brings us into really the events themselves. It's a great Thing you gotta, <clears throat> if you have time after festivities, you can, you can check it out. Um, but in, in all of that, we're trying to talk about the glory of Christ. Even good, our Good Friday services usually tends to be a little somber because we're talking about death, we're talking about suffering, and that, that tends to be somber. But we tried this year to switch a little bit to really celebrate and emphasize the glory of Christ. It is his glory that he became human, that he was born, that he lived his human life, that he grew up, that he, that he healed people, that he, he ministered to so many people. That's his glory. It's also his glory that he, that he died on the cross. It's also his glory that he resurrected from the dead. And so that's what we want to emphasize this morning and talk about how Jesus brings new life. We're going to be in the Gospel of Mark. We'll start in chapter 15, verse 42, where Jesus is buried. And uh, we'll go to the <clears throat> um, end of the Gospel. Pray with me as we begin. God, Thanks for bringing us here. You've orchestrated this gathering uh, at this time so that we could hear these words uh, from your scripture. Um, so speak to us loudly. Help us to hear your voice uh, above all other voices and things and, and stuff that might be getting in, in your way. It's so, so hard sometimes to actually hear your voice. God, would you speak clearly to us and may we hear it in a clear way. <clears throat> and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, there are four Gospels in the Bible. Each of them uh, are telling the uh, story of Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection. They all give a little bit of a different slant to it, but they're all looking at the same events. The Gospels are not newspaper articles. It's not just like a history book where you're just reading about events. They shaped these stories to tell us something. And so they're crafted narratives. Uh, it's not just strung together events that you kind of feel great about. It is, it, is, it is written with a particular purpose in mind, and we'll see that as we go through Mark. Mark was written for a church that was just starting to experience for the first time state-sponsored persecution. In the 60s AD, Rome really turned up... Uh, the persecution against Christians, the emperor decided to blame Christians for a fire that happened in Rome, and he started actually outlawing Christianity. And so all over the Roman Empire, the, the Christians were getting taken and killed or thrown into prison or beat up, all kinds of things. And I can't imagine what that was like to be sitting in a church and have people be gone or have your pastor be gone or, or, or leaders of the church just all of a sudden be gone, thrown in prison or killed. And you've had to watch that in the city square or whatever, and people have celebrated that. It's an awful time, and I can't imagine what that was like. I can't imagine what it was like to sit there and go, now Jesus rose from the dead, but why is this happening? How are we supposed to be able to get through this? That is in that context that Mark was written. Mark is trying to encourage the church in the midst of these types of difficulties, in the midst of not just the persecution difficulties, but all of the wrestlings that come with that. Mark is wanting to address that and encourage the believers and sympathize with their experience and show them the, a path through it. Uh, and so that's why he's writing this whole story. It's to encourage. It's written in the 60s, right in that time where all this is happening, where humanity is strongly and violently resisting the gospel. How do we handle 
that? How are we supposed to deal with that stuff given that Jesus is reigning as king? Let's pick up the end of the story. Verse 42. When evening had come, so Jesus has just died, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. So this act of Joseph, even though he's a powerful politician, he's a member of the ruling council, he's a wealthy individual within the wealthiest city in the whole area. He's very influential. It still was a courageous act for him to go and ask Pilate for the body, but he did it because of his conviction about the kingdom of God. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died or that he was potentially already dead. And so summoning the centurion, Pilate asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. Notice how many times Mark says the word dead. He's trying to help us understand something. Jesus died. Even calls the body a corpse. It's not that Jesus was kind of just fell asleep or was knocked unconscious. It's not like Romans didn't know how to check for pulse or any of those sorts of things. They knew he was dead. They're experts at killing. They had done crucifixions many times. The point of a crucifixion is to kill somebody, and they accomplished their goal. That's the point. Pilate's amazed that it happened so quick, but we know from other gospels why that was. And the bottom line is, is that he was dead. And so Joseph bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of rock. Mark is trying to show that this is a rich man's tomb. Joseph of Arimathea was obviously a man of great means. It was expensive to cut a tomb out of rock. It could have potentially been his own tomb that he was preparing for himself, but he, he gave it to Jesus' corpse. And that's to fulfill prophecy <clears throat> about Jesus being buried among the rich. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. And so they they see this tomb, they see the stone was rolled away. That's all a stone was rolled over the entrance. That's all normal stuff. Tomb robbery and uh, uh, that kind of thing was common in that day and age. You had to really protect tombs because you buried people with expensive things, which was a nice payday for tomb robbers. They could break in and steal stuff and then make money. Jesus was probably buried, with, if you look at John's gospel, Nicodemus joined Joseph of Arimathea and was buried potentially with fifty dollars to $70,000 worth of spices and ointments. I mean, they went all out. These guys were wealthy. That's a great payday if you're a tomb robber. Go steal that stuff. So there was security was a big deal. Roll that stone over the entrance so no one could get in. It's, it's a big stone. It's not just like one guy can come and heave it off or even three guys. It's a big deal, and he's a wealthy guy. He knows how to make things happen and how to make things secure. <clears throat> when Sabbath was passed, so it was the day of preparation. They bury him, and then they wait a full day. And then when Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, who's the same Mary as before, just uh, a different a child is named, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Why do you buy spices? Because that's what you do with dead bodies in their culture. This is what you do. You, you take care of the body, and you go through this process. That's what these women are preparing to do because they saw him die. And they, they saw him where he's buried. And so they're going on with the normal routines of death. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? They don't, they don't, they don't have a plan. I love that. How are we going to even get in there? We don't know. We got the spices, though. Let's go. <clears throat> and looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. No kidding. You know what the word alarmed means? Alarmed. <laughs> this is disorienting. This is troubling because of the culture of people stealing things from tombs. It's rolled away. Oh no, what's happened? Not only has our, has our Savior just been killed and brutally tortured, now he's getting more injustice done. What is going on? It's very disorienting. It's very alarming. And only that, they see this, whoever this guy is, sitting on the right side, but he's dressed in a white robe, which is Mark's way of telling us, this is an angel. What's the angel say? Don't be alarmed. Okay. Thanks, angel. <clears throat> Angels, man, they're always saying that. No one ever believes them. 
for obvious reasons. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Everybody's surprised. Everybody's having a hard time. Everybody's abandoned Jesus at this point, and it's all going according to plan. He told them already this was going to happen. And so the angel's like, get with the program, y'all. Do they get with the program? They went out and they fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And that's how the gospel ends. That's how this story ends in Mark. And now you have a footnote in your Bible. Some of the earliest manuscripts do not include 16, 9 through 20. And it goes on to give these stories and what we can tell as we compare manuscripts and all that stuff is none of this stuff was in the earliest writings and there's a lot of different communities that had different versions. Uh, And so most likely this stuff isn't original to the Gospel of Mark. He wanted to end it at verse 8. But people had so much tension about that and early on they had the other Gospels and so they were working with the other texts and and added some other things to sort of summarize what other Gospels were saying, even the book of Acts. So all this stuff in 9 through 20 isn't bad stuff. It's not like it's totally heretical. It's from other parts in the Bible. But what you can see is the early uh, believers are, are seeking to read Mark in context with the overall scriptures. I think that's what Mark intended to write. He knew other gospels were being written. He knew that they were forming this body of literature. And he wanted to contribute to it, but not write a newspaper article about the events that happened. He wanted to end his story in a way that would truly impact people. And so he personally and individually and deliberately puts the reader in tension. He doesn't end the story. There's many kinds of stories that do that in our day, and Mark Mark does that as well. He leaves us in suspense. Why does he do that? Well, he wants to, first of all, show that Jesus is alive, sure, and his overall point of the gospel is this, that Jesus brings new life, but Mark is concerned not just to make that announcement. He wants to tell us some things about this new life, and there's three, there's many things we could say. I'm just going to point out three things that he tells us about this new life, and that's I'm getting this from why he ends the story this way. First, Mark wants to tell us that new life starts with belief that Jesus died and rose again. New life is centered on belief in Jesus' death and resurrection. This whole story is about bringing you to the point of belief, bringing you to a point of decision about Jesus, not to just inform you of an event In other words, new life doesn't start by seeing the resurrected Jesus. New life starts with a decision about Jesus' death and resurrection. Do you think he did it or not? That's what Mark is trying to emphasize. And so he gives us two basic historic realities to put us right in the moment alongside these initial women disciples and to put us right there in the moment he's describing the emotion he's he's making us understand the tenseness of it but describing two historical realities that every even non-christian atheistic historians will validate it's almost universally accepted among humanity that jesus was a real historical person and that he was crucified that is attested in many different places besides the bible It's also attested in many different places and universally accepted that the tomb was empty. Do you know that? Historians, even non-Christians, believe and and know those two things to be true. And so Mark presents us with those two facts. First of all, Jesus was actually dead. Pilate's hesitant to even take him down from the cross. No, he's dead yet. No, he's dead. All right, okay, he's dead. And he was actually buried And then the tomb is empty. The the women arrive at the tomb and Jesus is not there. That's what the angel says and that's what they understand. And they didn't even understand that he'd resurrected. The the women go on to not really believe that or understand what's going on, even though the angel just told them. And even though Jesus had told them, they didn't understand. And Mary goes goes back and gets a couple disciples and they run to the tomb. They see that it's empty and they run away. And Mary stays behind and she hears another guy moving around and thinks it's the gardener. This is from John. She's like, hey, gardener, tell me what they, if you know where Jesus' body is, can you please tell me? Someone's taken it. They still don't know. They still don't believe. And it happens to be Jesus right then. 
He's like, uh, Mary. Ah, what? Everybody's minds are blown. But they didn't believe it at first. They struggled. And Mark wants to put us right there in that struggle because that's where we all are. Not everybody got to see the resurrected Jesus. He only appeared about 500 people is what 1 Corinthians 15 says. So as soon as they started spreading this gospel, especially outside of Jerusalem, you're going with people that never even saw Jesus. They have to deal, though, with these two historical realities. Jesus was crucified and the tomb is empty. And our tradition, our Christian tradition, is going with the interpretation of the angel. That's what we believe and the interpretation of all these eyewitnesses, that that tomb is empty because Jesus is not there. He rose from the dead. And that's what Mark goes on to just give us that simple thing. Here's two realities. He died, the tomb is empty. Here's the interpretation. He is not there. Look how simple it is. You seek Jesus of Nazareth. Hick from the sticks, in other words. He's from Podunkville, Israel. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He actually was crucified. He is risen. There's a simple interpretation. You've got these two historical realities. Every, every historical reality has some sort of interpretation. Here's the an angelic interpretation. Simply put, he is risen. There's nothing complicated about it. There's no bells and whistles. It's a simple message that Christians proclaim and that they begin to proclaim. And it's just this simple fact. He is risen. He's not here. And so the women and the followers of Jesus still struggled to believe this angelic announcement. They were under the assumption that the body was taken was taken. They're still reeling from the experience of what they've just witnessed in his awful trial and, and uh, torture and his death. They're, they're continuing to be grieved about the injustice and continuing in the pain and fear of it all, and it's masking their ability to really listen and believe the powerful work of God. Mark does all of this, all of this, to bring us to the simple question, do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? That's the most important fundamental question you have to ask yourself. When you're faced with these two historic realities, do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? That's a very important question, and it, and it needs to be asked all the time because we face all kinds of situations. But do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Then he can fix your marriage. Then he can lead you to forgive that person. Then he can guide your career path. He can restore the relationship with your kids. He can mo move you anywhere in the world. He can do all of that. Because it starts with the fundamental belief that Jesus rose from the dead. It's challenging for us to believe here in Mesa uh, because um, it seems like miracles aren't really happening all that much, uh, only on Instagram when people post it. But we know miracles are happening all over the place. Uh, many of us have experienced that in our lives. But there's, there's this thing where, where and especially in Western eyes, ah, that, that seems a little bit weird. And then there's all kinds of religious factions and divisions, and everybody's got their own version, and so we can just go, wow, there's so many of those things. Who knows what actually happened? Well, this is what actually happened. Jesus rose from the dead. And do you believe that? And so new life doesn't begin. Mark, Mark is saying new life doesn't begin by seeing the resurrected Jesus. New life begins by making a decision about what Jesus did. Do you believe that he died on the cross, rose, rose from the dead, and is coming back again? So let me announce to you very clearly, there's new life in Christ. We know this because he resurrected from the dead. And he's coming back again. Do you believe he died on the cross and rose from the dead? If you do, if you do embrace this, you get new life. And what Mark wants to say is that new life is found in Christ, but he also cares about this early church, and he cares about us to really teach us about aspects of this new life because it's, it's a little bit different than what we would expect. So he wants to tell us a couple more things about this new life. Not only does it start with belief that Jesus died and resurrected, but here's what we find about this new life. In this new life, you will experience uncomfortability, failure, and a wide range of unexpected emotions. In this life, you will experience uncomfortability, failure, and a wide range of unexpected emotions. Get used to it. That's my sales pitch. How's that? Now, it's a strange way to s sell something. Hey, you should come and believe in Jesus. Well, why should I? Because it's going to make you uncomfortable. 
You're going to never know what's happening, and you're going to experience all these range of emotions, and it's, there could be some frustrations and confusions. Isn't it great? That's not how sales pitches go. I haven't seen a car commercial or a state farm commercial that talks about them making you feel uncomfortable. But this is the reality of new life with Christ, and that's what's on full display here in Mark's endings. From our seat, the reaction of these women and, and the disciples that follow in the other Gospels, we, we judge their reaction as wrong, and it is. They lack the faith, but that's the point. They're putting their lack of faith on display. Even at the earliest moments of the resurrection of Jesus, people were struggling and this is actually a huge theme in the story of Mark. Every time Jesus describes himself as the Messiah who is going to suffer, they reject that, that reality. They don't really listen to him, and they don't want to embrace that. Because God's glory is different than our expectations. So embracing Jesus is difficult, not because he's deceitful or manipulative or he's lying or anything like that, or it's illogical. Embracing Jesus is and his glory is difficult because it's so profound and so unexpected. God's glory operates in a different currency than human glory. And we've got to get used to that currency, but it's really hard for us. So the Bible gives all kinds of images of the glory of God. And there's all these visions of his actual throne room. One of the more common ones that society tends to know is that in heaven the streets are paved with gold. That's not to show how wealthy God is. That's to show how different he is. That this thing of gold that's so glorious and valuable for humanity and everything, everything is about chasing more gold, that's pavement in God's economy. It has, it's, it's a totally different way of operating. And so uh, part of this journey is that we have to learn this new currency of glory. And God's teaching us this as we journey. And so we kind of judge the reactions of these first eyewitnesses. They, they actually speak to our own reactions to God's work in our lives. We often miss it. We often fumble around. We can't quite see it. We come, we, we come to a little bit confused or a little frustrated or just not quite understanding what's going on. We fumble in our comprehension. And God knows that. It's been happening since day one. And Mark is wanting to say, hey, this experience, as you're, in, as you're engaged in this persecution, you're fumbling through it, that's been happening since the early days. This is part of this new life, is experiencing a different kind of glory. And so he still pursues, even in the midst of our failures. He still seeks, he still loves, he still nurtures you along. And so we can still trust Jesus, even though we don't fully comprehend. And we do this all the time. <clears throat> I was a pretty much straight-A student in junior high and high school. Uh, I went to Mountain View High School, a large university. I was graduating. A, a I can't remember what no, rank I was or whatever. It's not important. The point is, is that I was pretty smart and good at school. I knew how to do the assignments and get good grades. Then in freshman year, I went to college. I was in uh, engineering, and I was like taking Calc 2, and then I took physics. And I could barely squeak out a C. And I was like devastated because I'm like, I don't understand this. And no matter how hard I tried, I went to tutoring, I would go to the professor, I'd do all this extra homework, all kinds of stuff. I'd get to the test, pff, C or D. And it was just like, ugh. I said this story a couple other times. People were like, hey, C's pretty good. You know? <laughs> but for me, it was like, I just don't understand this. And it was so disorienting. I was like, I was like I'm done with engineering. I went a completely different route, obviously, with my life. I had no... I will not lecture you on physics at all. But I still push my kid on the swing. And I know he's going to come back. And when I go to the Grand Canyon, I'm very careful around the edge. In other words, there are a lot of things in life that we don't fully comprehend, but we still put into practice. And, and, and faith is not just this thing where it's like, well, I just blindly do it. I don't have to think about it. I'm never going to comprehend it. No, that's not the point of the analogy. The point of the analogy is there's going to be a difficulty to comprehend, but we still can seek it. And, it, and th there's a search to the Lord and a, and a beauty in understanding it as you are in relationship with him. And so faith isn't something where you just go, well, I just have to blindly believe. No, it's, a, it's an intentional engagement of learning about God's glory. It's totally unexpected. This church is a great example. I mean, look at all of you. Isn't it crazy that this little group right here is here? 
And that this has been orchestrated to, to declare the glory of God and to sing his praise. I mean, all of our backgrounds in here, all the things that we've done, you would never put a lot of us in this room. People would be like, there's no way they would be there. But here we are. This is the glory of God on full display. Now, it's totally unexpected. It's totally not a human glory, but it's God's glory. It truly is amazing to have people like us declaring his praise. Amen? To have a person like me up here. But God's an amazing God. So what happened to these disciples? How did they change? The ending of Mark is pointing us to Acts chapter 2. These disciples, these early disciples, all of them fumbled around. Believing, doubting, believing, needing to see Jesus, and they had a number of interactions. They still didn't really recognize him, and it was just kind of fumbling until the Holy Spirit comes. That's where the change happens. They didn't become bold world changers until they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what Mark is trying to say. It's not about seeing Jesus. It's about believing in him and receiving the greatest gift that Jesus could ever give, which is the Holy Spirit. He is the one who invades your heart and truly brings about real transformation and change. Not just surfacey things to get you to do something, but real lasting internal change. The very core desires and wants that you have of your heart, the Holy Spirit comes in and invades The Holy Spirit is here to help us believe and actually bring concrete experience and growth in your trust of Jesus. We've spent the entire this year, the entirety of this year so far, talking about a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because he's the greatest gift Jesus ever gives all of his followers. He gives it to everybody. The Holy Spirit is in you if you believe in Jesus Christ. And he's the one who brings about real, lasting change. And so you might experience uncomfortability, but the Holy Spirit, Spirit is here. He's incredibly powerful. God himself dwells inside believers, and that's truly, truly amazing. So Mark wants to end his gospel this way, to bring us to the point where we ask, do I actually believe Jesus rose from the dead? And he also wants to tell us a little bit about that life to to say that, hey, as you experience this life, there's going to be some uncomfortability. There's going to be some tension because you're, you're, you're learning from a God who's absolutely amazingly glorious. And he does things like rise from the dead. That's not supposed to happen. People don't do that. It's truly amazing. Third, and finally, he wants to show us that this new life hasn't come to its resolve. Yet, This new life hasn't come to its resolve yet. And so yes, Jesus rose from the dead and we celebrate that and we sing and we we have great happiness today. But in terms of human history, we are not at the end of the story. Jesus is not reigning fully from Jerusalem and restoring all things. We're waiting for that day. And so it's great that Jesus rose from the dead and we celebrate that, but we're also forward looking because the story is not over. And Mark ends with this kind of tension to show that, that yes, Jesus is risen, but there's much more that's going to come. And so while the disciples eventually received the Holy Spirit and found courage to proclaim the gospel to the farthest reaches of the known world, they were martyred. And for 2,000 years, the world has resisted the message. Christianity is still a minority movement. And that's because this new life hasn't come to its resolve yet. And so as Mark is trying to encourage these believers who are going through intense persecution, it's great encouragement for all of us because we view all of this resistance and this difficulty through the lens of Jesus reigning as king. And we have to understand that the end of the story hasn't happened yet. And so there is still great grief, injustice, and incompleteness to our lives. That's what we see on display here at the ending of Mark, even with the resurrection story. Now, don't get me wrong. There's still great healing available. There's still great restoration. There's still great joy and happiness in following Christ. And I experience all those things in a daily way. And it's truly amazing to be in relationship with Jesus. And I want to be careful also to say that there is unnecessary pain in your life. That when you're not following Jesus and his instructions in a certain way, there's going to be pain. There's going to be hardship and when you, when you bring that 
area of life into submission to his instruction, you start trying to follow him in the midst of that situation, there's going to be great healing and restoration and benefit from that. He restores and he brings life, but there's also going to continue to be hardship as you seek to live as he wants you to live. And the earliest followers of Jesus put that on full display. They didn't talk about how their lives were all great and happy. They talked about how much they struggled. And they put that on full display in these stories. Accepting Jesus is going to break relationships apart. It's going to cause you to uh, have all kinds of internal turmoil because you're going to recognize all of a sudden that that conflict that you had, that you thought and were sure it was that other person's fault, it's actually partially mine. And all of a sudden you're not as good as you think you are. But you're also not as bad as you think you are. Because there's that voice as well. And what we see is that there's, there's this truth about who Jesus is and who he sees you as and who he wants to create you to be. And it's just this amazing gospel, good news message. And so Mark wants us to know that this new life hasn't come to its resolve yet. He wants to point us to the fact that we Christians have a certainty about the future. We know Jesus resurrected, and so we know he's coming back one day again to judge and to reign on this earth. We know that. We have a great certainty about the future, but we have no idea what tomorrow holds. We live in a tremendous paradox every day. And Mark wants to show us that and show us that that's part of this new life. There's going to be this tension that we have a certainty about the future, but we have no idea what tomorrow holds. I know it's coming in the future. I can't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. Our calling then as we look at this, our calling is not to live a perfect life where everything is under control and everything looks put together and we try to have this appearance and semblance of everything put together. That's not our calling in this life. Our calling is to transparently proclaim the promise of new life to come. That's what Mark puts on full display here. He doesn't show how all the disciples got it all figured out and once Jesus resurrected, everybody's life was fine. No. Our calling is to transparently proclaim the promise of the new life to come, which begins now by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's our calling. That's what Mark wants to guide us in. Jesus rose from the dead. He's risen. I could hear the people through the camera. Thanks, camera people. He is risen. We want to sing two final songs. Let's pray as we respond with great worship to Christ's glory. Jesus, you are truly glorious in a way that we can not even fully comprehend. And yet we know you are a Savior. We know that you love us, and we sense that. We've experienced your grace. Lord, I pray that as we worship, you would unite us. I pray that we would truly experience the greatness of your glory. God, we lift our praise to you because you are the king and you deserve all glory. It's all yours. And so we worship you with one voice. I pray that you'd continue to speak to us about our lives and about this new life that's possible. Help us to embrace you more fully in our hearts. Help us to experience the greatness of this new life as we worship you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.